Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing, a no-hype, mission-focused channel trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. I've been asked from the beginning, since I first started making videos here on YouTube, folks say, hey Daniel, can you check out Dropbox, DBX stock? And honestly, I've been hesitant. I, I haven't been looking to do it because I always thought to myself, wait a second, isn't this just a commoditized drive business, commoditized online cloud storage business. What, what's the appeal here? What, you know, how could this possibly be unrivaled? And that's the basis of this channel is I'm looking for exceptional companies, unrivaled companies that could potentially grow at good clips years into the future, delivering satisfactory and potentially excellent returns for shareholders. I'm looking for companies that could be multi-backers, stocks that can go up hundreds or thousands percent over time. So you need, there needs to be something special about the business model or their operating approach that can set them apart over time. And so finally, I was like, okay, I've been asked for the umpteenth time to look at Dropbox. So now I decided to do it, pulled it back. And honestly, it was a mistake for me to wait so long to look at it, partly because they are not just a commoditized cloud storage business. There's a lot more that's actually going on here. And we're going to talk about Dropbox, what sort of they're doing right now to set themselves apart as a collaboration tool. And that I think is a really interesting angle for them to be leaning in on, uh, as well as their valuation where honestly, this company is a is a cash cow with with caveats. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And it has a sensible valuation. I wouldn't put it as the crazy expensive or crazy cheap. Um, but you know what? A lot of viewers know that I can be on the conservative side. So you'll have to have your own take uh, at the end of this video. And I'd love to hear your assumptions and your your thoughts in the comments below. So let's let's go through what we see here with Dropbox right now. So historically, cloud storage, backup and syncing, file sync and sharing. There's a lot more that they're layering on now with additional functionality like professional sharing or project management saying, hey, this is the person that's in charge of this folder. You know, we're going to be uploading things here. You can see items develop over time because people are saving drafts in a folder e-signature. Oh, okay. You need to make sure this thing, you know, this document gets signed, this NDA, whatever. It needs to get signed. Oh, maybe the assistant sends it out, make sure it happens. Personal privacy. There's just a lot more functionality here where they're building it from a storage business that is commoditized, that is definitely not unrivaled, to something that might have a very strong value proposition, maybe addressing a very specific niche. And interestingly enough, they have about 700 million registered users, 550 billion pieces of content across their platform, but only about 15.8 million paying users. Now, and they also talk about how 80% use it for work. And so this alone, this, this slide alone does strike me as the heart of the opportunity, because if you can keep adding more and more collaboration functionality each year, greater integration with other apps, greater functionality that says, hey, it's worth paying up for a lot. You, you do have about 90% of their users, the 700 million registered users come in via effectively their free self-service channel but they might still be using it for work purposes. And so the question is, how do you create, how do you increase the monetization rate from this 2%, 15.8 million of 700 million, how do you increase it to 4% or 6 or 10%? Because that's really the opportunity if you're able to dramatically increase that paying user base. And I think it's a function of multiple different things like new features leading to upselling such as password management. And this is a functionality that you have one off companies do. Hey, now you can do it with Dropbox. You know, you can have a function where it's like, oh, yeah, anything, you know, that you need, we can have the password stored for it, like Netflix, easily be able to access those websites. Yeah, this is now a password manager, you know, the traditional backup. Yes, this is what you traditionally expect. But hey, maybe I need to be backing up my computer on a regular basis, or I need to be coordinating with my computer and my laptop. And you know, just need to make sure it has classic you know, sync functionality, or I can just retrieve things historically. And then also not only adding new features, but also looking at mergers and acquisitions where they're targeting, I'd say tuck in acquisitions, things where they could spend 100, 200 million dollars in cash and add a lot of functionality, collaborative, you know, a collaboration driven functionality such as Hello Sign, which they acquired, I believe in 2019, which effectively says, hey, you need to sign this document and tracking how the document 
signature progress is working. And so you can send it for signature, you can, you know, track the document within Dropbox. And this is actually one of their higher growth sub segments or sub profit lines or business drivers We're seeing 70% plus growth in their end user signature requests launched in 21 additional languages. So this is something they bought it and they said, Hey, this is a natural fit within Dropbox as people need to share documents, say, Hey, you know, maybe there's, there's some sort of deal we're bringing on new employees. Yeah, if you're going to be bringing on a new employee, you need to make sure they sign the contract and you need to track that down and say, oh, Okay, the head of HR signed it and the, you know, the new employee signed it or there's a contractor, there's a vendor, you need to make sure you're tracking all this down and it's kept in a centralized way. So that way you know who can see it and where it is. And the approach that's driven by, let's say, acquiring these little niche programs, these this niche functionality, it is a bit of a mixed bag because there is this risk of overpaying uh, where you don't really know like, hey, are they going to be overpaying for this? Is it $300 million for immaterial revenue? You know, like, is that is that what you're doing? And it also makes me wonder, like, hey, shouldn't this functionality been something that you already built out organically? This isn't, isn't that what your R&D budget is, the hundreds of millions spent over time on R&D? Shouldn't this be of something, a functionality that you've already built out or can't just replicate yourself? And so it, it does, it is sort of a question mark for me. That said, if it does sort of accelerate their value proposition saying, hey, this hello sign, this ability to track document signatures within Dropbox increases that functionality, that value proposition sooner then maybe it is worthwhile. And they do a series of tuck and acquisitions like that that really makes Dropbox, you know, sing for their users, for their paying users. And so that I always view M&A as sort of a mixed bag um, because I prefer organic growth ultimately. And so does the stock market and business and investors longer term. Another example is buying Docsend, which is a more recent deal. And this, in all honesty, I've used Dropbox. I've used, used Docsend back in my prior prior career when I was working to run the finances of a fast growing payments company, we use Docsend for one of our financing rounds. And, uh, you know, honestly, the whole time I thought to myself, man, this is just like a niche version of Dropbox, why hasn't Dropbox really leaned into this content. And so, you know, it's interesting to me that here it is, they're buying them for $165 million in cash. And they say that it's immaterial impact on their 2021 operating results. So, you know, it, it makes me wonder, is that actually a good deal? Is this something, once again, that they should have been able to build out for themselves? Uh, that said, it is a f worthwhile functional tool, you know, for, let's say, a very sensitive virtual data room regarding, let's say, a capital raise or investor relations presentation, sales and marketing, a lot of different sensitive things where it's about, you know, the document workflow, who can actually see it. Did they, when did they access it? You get a notification when someone opened it, you know, signatures, all that sort of stuff. So additional detail that that's worthwhile. And so then the next question is, are they un unrivaled? And that's once, hence the name of this channel, Unrivaled Investing. And you know, I'm looking for those exceptional companies because if a company is unrivaled, the short answer is it gives you the right to win longer term. And I, you know, the, the quick solution, the quick answer to this is nope, no, they're, they're not unrivaled, but that might be an overly simplistic take as there are definitely a lot of players out there like Box, which focuses more on the enterprise. Google Drive, like that's that was the one that always made me go, well, wait a second, Google Drive has something like a billion daily users. And here it is, they only have 15 million paid users. Now, Google Drive does include mostly, you know, free users, I believe, but they still might be able to have a very strong value proposition, despite the fact that they're competing against several different players. And this gets back to the point that this is no longer just a commoditized storage business. Where here it is, it's about developing an open ecosystem versus this walled garden. So you can have pretty much any device, whether or not it's a mobile phone, laptop, uh, you know, desktop, and you know, you, you can have an iPad or some sort of pad, and it could be across different platforms, whether or not it's Android or Windows, Apple or uh, Linux. And um, it is integrated in so many different functions, so many different apps, and that that is an advantage relative to, let's say, the walled garden of being with Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive, where it just works better when they're agnostic to what platform you're using. They're agnostic to what tools you're using. And that does create, I think, 
a little bit more of an advantage for them is, well, wait a second, how many people need a collaborative, you know, a collaboration tool that is agnostic, that can function with users across the spectrum, whether or not they're PC or Mac or Linux or what have you. And that is something that makes me think, oh, okay, maybe there's more to this. And the reality is as you dig more and more and you see all these different types of business plans that they offer from free to plus family, professional, standard, advanced enterprise, and you see the different pricings from as low as 12 bucks a month to as high as 25 bucks a month per user, you realize that this really is not just a storage company anymore. And it's about adding more and more to sort of this niche functionality. For example, with professionals, it's watermarking. So that way people can open up these documents and, oh, you have a watermark or branded sharing or image search. Adding all this additional functionality that becomes helpful that people would say, you know what, this is a major time saver. This is a major productivity tool. It would be worth paying for, such as having a vault where it's all this sensitive information. You know what, not only do I want to have this in my Dropbox, but I want it protected by a pin or something like that. Or HIPAA compliance if you're in the medical profession and you need to be able to say, hey, only doctors and this is, I, this is approved for medical data transfer information. So this is not just a commoditized storage company. And I believe focusing on the niche cases is ultimately how they're going to be able to defeat the much larger players, such as a Google Drive with a billion plus daily users. This is how you create real value. This is potentially how you can even become unrivaled is by focusing on these niche cases and being some something for everyone, including all these little one off markets, whether or not it's being able to audit the logs. Okay, who opened this? When did they open it? You know, who accessed it? Who changed it? all this different functionality that might be really valuable to different players. Now, what about the valuation? Here it is. I'm going to do a quick plug as I usually do. But once again, if this is your first time tuning in, my name is Daniel. You're watching Unrivaled Investing. If you're enjoying learning about Dropbox, please make a point of subscribing or hitting that thumbs up button. If you want to follow my personal journey to see what potential multi-baggers I'm buying for myself, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Each week, I call out what am I buying and selling, any sort of market thoughts, First week of the month, I call it my full portfolio. And then once a month during the month, I call it a potential multi-bagger. And I'll talk more about that this month's potential multi-bagger at the end of this video where I'm looking at something where I think it's asymmetric risk reward and something where I'm like looking for something that maybe it goes up a couple hundred percent over time. That's what I'm looking for each month. Maybe I could buy, put 2% of my portfolio, 4% of my portfolio on something where it's like, yeah, if this if this works out over time, this could be worth five. 500% higher, a thousand percent higher. And that's, that's how I'm thinking about this. Let's get back into Dropbox. And so what about the valuation? And there's a lot of parts I think you need to consider and, and buckle up folks, because this is actually going to be a little bit trickier than usual because one is understanding their organic growth, which is, you know, they're effectively seeing 8% paying user growth. At least that's what they saw in 2020. And they saw about a 4% increase in, in payments. Oops, that, that isn't supposed to, be, supposed to be opening up. Get out of here. Um, Sorry about that. And so here it is. You know, the, you see pricing power of 4% and customer base growing by 8%. And that's, that's nice to see. But this is not hyper growth when you're looking at this. This is, I'd argue... This, this pencils out to like, okay, maybe high single digits or maybe teens level growth in the years ahead. That's what I think about as I look at this. And so then the next element is, well, wait a second, what do you think this business looks like in the years ahead? And so they talk about how, where, what the, this business looked like in 2019 and 2020, about 20% about operating margins, about 500 million in free cash flow. But they say longer term, let's say by 2024, your profits can be about 50% higher than where they currently are from around 20% operating margin to about 28 to 30% and a billion plus in annual free cash flow, which should resonate to a lot of folks. Wow, that's a lot, especially for a business that's only about a $12 billion business. That would strike you as like, wow, that could be pretty cheap. Now, the concern here, and this is you always got to read the footnotes, is it talks about, note, margin and expenses exclude stock-based compensation expense. Oh, okay, so we're going to need to dig into that. But also, we want to understand some of these things in greater detail. Like, one question I have asking myself is, wait a second, if 90% of your 
business effectively comes from a self, self-service perspective, why do you have to spend 20% on sales and marketing? Isn't that something that you could actually get a lot more, you know, lower, lower the amount? Isn't that a low, a, a poor usage of, of how you're spending your capital? I mean, it, it's just a question that seems weird to me. Um, for you to be spending 23, 20% and then like, oh yeah, longer term, we're still at 20%. That doesn't really make sense to me. So this is, this is one of the things that this, this whole like, oh yeah, we'll be at 30% profits and a billion dollars in free cash flow. And we did nearly 500 million in free cash flow in 2020. Wait a second, wait a second. So of that free cash flow, of that free cash flow, about 260 million and 260 million in 2019 as well, was due to stock-based compensation. And stock-based compensation is a real expense. And this is where you get happy numbers that just don't drive with reality because here it is, they're saying 490 million in free cash flow, but you have to factor in that there's 260 million benefit from stock-based compensation. Wait, that, that's a real expense. So if you back that out of it, well, wait a second, then your margins are much lower. So it does make you wonder, well, wait a second, what are the long-term margins actually? Because this is supposedly benefiting from stock-based compensation. And then this is the part that really starts bothering me is that if you look in 2020, they spent about 400 million on buybacks. So 490 million in free cash flow, 400 million in buybacks, but their weighted average shares still managed to increase about 1% in 2020. So this 400 million buyback didn't even offset the full impact of their stock-based compensation. So this is the part that, that gets tricky is, yeah, you can say, oh yeah, the company technically does have that cash flow coming in, but your percentage of the pie each year is also going to be decreasing by, you know, maybe four or 5% a year, unless they take this same free cash flow and use it to buy back stock. In which case your ownership of the pie only decreases by, let's say 1%. Either way, I don't like this sort of you know, move, moving the, the full card Monty or whatever, whatever it's called, where it's like moving pieces around to say, Hey, look how much free cash flow we have. But in reality, your ownership of the pie is just decreasing and the cash flow didn't really actually build up. And that's what I'm seeing here. I'm sort of saying, well, wait a second. Does that, does that make any sense to me to see 1% dilution when you spend 400 million on stock, on, on stock repurchases? Oh, well, that's because you're using a phony baloney number. And so if, if management wanted to be more sincere, they would say, you know what, we need to either, hey, pay our employees more with cash and salaries, and they certainly can do that, or recognize that this is a legitimate expense, stock-based compensation, and say, hey, these figures are phony baloney numbers. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying these guys are bad people. I'm not saying like, hey, the Dropbox management is shady. I'm not saying that. They, they're, they're caught up with a lot of other companies that have their heads up there and just aren't thinking clearly about this, in my opinion. I think it's fairly obvious. If, you're, if your share of the pie is shrinking each year, that's an expense for you. So it should be recognized. And so then the next you know, aspect, and this, this, this one actually bothered me even more, was in a recent interview, uh, Drew Houston uh, was talking at one of these banker uh, conferences and he goes, he, he views you know, what happened in, in 2020 as a huge opportunity for us talking about the shift to remote work. I mean, it's really, and more really, it's hard to point to a better time in history to be building and selling and selling collaboration software for distributed work. Let me repeat that. It's hard to point to a better time in history to be building and selling collaboration software for distributed work. That's what they're doing. That's what they're focused on. So then they talk about, so in our core business, there's a huge need for one organized place for individuals and their teams to be able to easily and safely organize their content. Yep, we understand that. That's what Dropbox is doing. And you think about what's one thing you lose when you're not physically together, you lose a lot of context, right? You don't have the water cooler conversations and so on. Hence the importance of having some sort of tool like Dropbox that can play a big role with helping the team's knowledge dealing with the remote environment. And so they talk about, oh yeah, so there's a lot of workflows that revolve around Dropbox, including HelloSign, their e-signature, one of our fastest growing businesses. We bought a company called Docsend to further extend our capabilities in document workflow. Then they talk about doc Dropbox spaces, like how do you organize content around meetings and projects? And so they talk about the organic growth potential as well as this growth through M&A. And I've already called out my concerns with M&A. 
Now, the part that gets me with all this is, wait a second, if you're telling me you can't think of a better time in this company's history to be selling your, your services, you should be putting up some monster growth. Yet, in fiscal 20, they only grew by 15%. In the first quarter of 2021, they only grew about 12% year over year. So I'm not seeing the crazy, oh yeah, this is, we are really knocking it out of the park. This is, that that bothers me to, to hear it. And this, this get once again, gets to this sort of happy talk perspective of like, oh yeah, yeah, 490 million free cash flow. This is a happy talk. You know, you have real stock-based compensation. That's a real expense. So I, I view this as the management needs to get dinged here for that, in my opinion. Now, as I look at the valuation, you know, considering all these different variables that we've talked about and where the stock currently trades, and it currently trades around a $12 billion valuation, you know, they grew about 19% revenue growth in 2019, about 15% in 2020. This year, they're guiding to effectively low teens. And so I'm penciling out 14, 15, 16%. It's a pretty tight range. That said, maybe they beat it. Maybe their recent acquisitions are actually add even more than what they've sort of indicated. Maybe it's not immaterial like they've said. Maybe it can juice up their numbers. But effectively, they've, they've said effectively 2.1 to 2.2 billion in revenue. And so that's pretty much what I'm penciling out. 14 to 16%. I also give them way more credit than they should, in my opinion, by giving 25 to 30% profit margins longer term. And so they say high, high 20s, like 30% profit margin potentially. But once again, that includes stock based compensation. So that's, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to you to think about how you want to address that when you consider the valuation. Slap on a tax rate. And you effectively have, on an optimized margin perspective, people are effectively paying. 25 times to 30 times this business. And keep in mind, this is a business where the users are only growing by 8% and they raise prices effectively by 4% or upselling. So you're looking at low teens growth, slap on some M&A with all that free cash flow, and maybe you get even better. And so that's the reason why I think, and keep in mind, this is a hypothetical framework that I think over five years, you know, that's why I'm penciling out a fairly wide range of let's say eight to 15% on an annualized basis. And let's say, oh, in five years from now, what's the end multiple? Maybe 15 times to 30 times, a pretty wide range as well. You know, in the low case, people are just saying, hey, the growth here isn't that great. You do have this, you know, lots of free cash flow, but it's going to buy back stock and I'm still getting diluted. And, you know, at the end of the day, this, this valuation range implies, yeah, at this price, maybe you lose about 30%, but maybe you make about 100% plus for your return. So I, I view this as a reasonable stock. I think it's really interesting that they're leaning into their niche. I think it is possible that they increase their value proposition, potentially becoming more competitive, potentially even unrivaled over time. Like one way they could do that potentially is what if they merged with Box, which is one of their competitors that focuses more on the enterprise than they do. And so I just, you know, if they were to do that, you'd probably get you know, any sort of regulatory blessing just because you could say, well, wait a second, this storage market's just huge. But if you're focusing on the, the enterprise niche, like what they're trying to do in very specific functionality, that would be something that, let's say, Google Drive isn't interested in, Microsoft isn't interested in, and they could probably really start making a lot of money there. Um, so I think a lot depends in terms of the story on mergers and acquisition. Are they going to be intelligent with their policies are they going to be intelligent with buying things at a sensible valuation will they be buying things that are worthwhile tuck in acquisition so those those are things that that get me interested i i do think the odds of let's say consolidation in in the sector are higher given the fact that this company at the end of the day is a, is a 10 billion dollar plus company and it's not growing at hyper speed you know it's it's organic growth is effectively low teens and so you know i i look at it and then I compare it to what I'm seeing elsewhere. And part of what I love doing about investing is I'm constantly turning over rocks. That's what I part of, part of what I view of being the, you know, looking at unrivaled investing and thinking of it as a journey is it's just constantly turning over rocks, trying to find things, trying to find hidden treasure. And so for my monthly potential multibagger that I called out to the, you know, unrivaled nation at unrivaledinvesting.com, you know, for, for the July potential multibagger, I'm looking at a company that that's guiding to 80% growth this year in trades at a comparable multiple and has similar comparable margins. So it's actually a lower price to sales multiple than what 
you know, here it is, you're looking at Dropbox. So that's the type of thing that gets me interested. It's like, oh, okay, I see Dropbox and Dropbox is trading at five to six times sales. And then I see this other company and it's growing, you know, 80% and probably has organic growth of 30, 40, 40% a year. And it trades at three to four times sales. Yeah, now, now I'm getting interested. You know, maybe the margins are slightly lower, but you know, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Um, if you're interested in looking at my other potential multibaggers, you know, a few months back, I called a company trading below liquidation value that I think has two to three X upside. So anywho, that's at unrivalinvesting.com. If this video was helpful for you, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, if this video was helpful for you, please make a point of subscribing, hitting that thumbs up. I'd love to hear your thoughts if you are a Dropbox shareholder. You know, what if, if you're short the stock, if you're long the stock, whatever it is, I wanna hear your take on it. You know, if you think this leaning into collaborative tools could potentially make them unrivaled or maybe a merger with Box is, is even possible. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.